all of a sudden, all these people started coming out of the trees. We, we just stayed down in our foxhole, and uh, some of the guys with flamethrowers uh, took out the tanks. And this mortar landed and hit my buddy and just tore his tummy apart. Made you realize that uh, well, life can be taken away in three seconds. And our Sherman tank, he just went and it ran over top of him. He was amazed that that Sherman would take out their cannon. Warning, the frontline testimony you're about to hear is, at times, extremely graphic. The realities of war are often difficult, but it's vitally important that these stories are told and the lessons are learned. Your discretion is advised. Before the war broke out, what were you planning on doing with your life? What was your dream? Oh, I don't know. I, uh, there in Sacramento, and when I went to high school, uh, I was a junior in high school and uh, before Pearl Harbor. And I wasn't really, I didn't have a major uh, on my menu. <laughs> I played tennis and the soccer. I was too small for basketball and I not heavy enough for football. <laughs> so I was out on the lower guys in the sports <laughs> racket. <laughs> Or bracket, I guess. And, but, uh, and could you please tell us, how did you hear about the attack on Pearl Harbor? What were you doing? We were in class, and it, it was announced over a so-called loudspeaker. And uh, we, we, we had uh, several Japanese boys and girls in our class. And... Uh, and and it's too bad after after class they had to go out and sign up and they uh took them to a concentration camp there in Sacramento. You mentioned one of your friends went in the navy, one went to the air force. Right. And so the other two, you and the other boy, what happened? We we went in the Marines. So how why did you change your mind from the air force to the Marines? Because they at the time, uh, we in, they interviewed, and they said that they me needed communications guys. And I had worked uh, at the telephone company for a couple of years, and uh, so I was kind of qualified for, you know, along the electronics line, not electrical, electronics. So when they told us that uh, they needed radio operators, I figured, hey, that should sounds be all right. So so that's why I signed up for the Marines. And so after you signed up for the Marine Corps, take us through what happens to you, please. We went to uh, San Diego uh, through boot camp. And then again, we went uh, after boot camp, three months, we went to radio school. And of course, that was that was another six weeks, and we learned about the radio that we would carry on our back, and it was uh, twenty-two pounds, and I weighed about one hundred and fifty pounds. I don't know how I did that. <laughs> I often look back. I, how in the world did I carry that radio? For those who don't know, Mr. Nelson, can you describe the role? of a radio man in combat, what do you expect it to do? Uh, well, they told us before we left, and also aboard ship going over. We went straight to New Caledonia first, and we were there a few weeks, and they told us uh, that we would be following at least a second lieutenant or a first lieutenant, and that we would be the only communications between him and his company. Because if we were in a foxhole 20 or 30 feet away, he needed some way to contact that sergeant that, in charge of that particular platoon. And, and they, they told us about that. 
They told us how we would react and they would stay right with the lieutenant. And once we got our lieutenant, then probably we would pretty well follow him through that particular invasion. Can you explain how the radio actually functioned? Oh, we just had a little... Uh, we had... We had a mic and and you could you could run code if you wanted to uh but the mic was audio and all you do is just press a button and the radio was on and it it transmitted to whatever frequency you had and i could reach back over my shoulder and turn a switch and put it on one of four channels. So if I wanted to talk to Company B, that's where I'd go to. Or if I wanted to, I had a message for the lieutenant in, in the C Company, I would move the little radio switch to that frequency. And, and what so. were the messages that you were relaying? Can you give us some examples? Oh, that, that, uh, it's like, this is A Company, we're receiving fire from this hillside. Would, would you lay down a, a barrage of mortar or artillery and uh, concentrate on that particular? And then the lieutenant would give me, it's a hill four, hill 405 or whatever. And... Uh, that's, that's the kind of message we I would relay. And tell us about your assignment. How did you join your unit, and what unit did you eventually join? Well, we when we got into prison, Australia, that's where we were assigned to. I was assigned to the first battalion, and uh, there was some guys assigned to what they call the headquarters, and from the headquarters. They, they, um, they had guys that would relieve us in the field, and then you would go back to the headquarters and wait for the next invasion. And, and for the record, could you please tell us uh, what regiment and what division were you a part of? I was at the 1st Battalion, and the battalion had three companies of 30 men. And then uh, the regiment was had three battalions. So I was with the 1st Battalion, the 5th Regiment, and, of course, the 1st Marine Division. So you joined the 1st Marine Division in Australia. They had just come back from Guadalcanal. Right. Tell me, did some of the veterans of that campaign tell you about their experiences? Some of them. they, Some of them guys didn't want to talk about it, you know. It was their first experience. And uh, they, uh, we didn't learn too much about, you know, the guys. Actually, they went to, uh, they went to Melbourne, Australia, and we went to Brisbane. So it, it took, you know, like six weeks to get together and uh, to form a, a unit. I didn't know what unit I would be with. One unit, I, I went with uh, a tank battalion, and I was a radio man, and I kept radio with the tank radio men. And uh, we got... We would, uh, a patrol would follow that tank across a particular valley, or maybe a half mile. At one time, uh, we were going along and we went down across kind of a little creek and pretty muddy. And uh, all of a sudden, we started getting shells from the backside. So we turned around and 
here embedded into the a cave. It was only about oh the the I guess you could call it mountain. There's a ridge, maybe be fifty foot. We had just come across it, and uh, we went out in front, and here the Japanese were in caves into that ridge, and they started firing us machine guns, and there were, I think there was seven guys killed before we was able to turn the tank around, and out of, you know, out of about 12. When we come to a cave, there would be a, a quite a, a number of Japanese soldiers in that cave, and they would throw flamethrowers and uh, hand grenades, and of course we couldn't penetrate real deep in the cave. We didn't know how deep it was. So towards the evening, they would send a lady out, and she would have a hand grenade underneath her arms. And uh, and when we, they she got out there, she'd hold her open, open her arms, and and of course she'd be killed. But sometimes uh, one of the guys would would realize what she was doing. Do you remember where this was, sir? Uh, this this is on Pelino. Did you ever see uh, the Japanese caves get buried? You know, instead of the entrance getting dirt piled up. Yeah. Can you so yeah? Can you tell us about that in your words, please? Yeah, in some of the caves on the north end of the island, the uh, bulldozers would uh, push dirt up and actually bury the caves. You, they couldn't get out. So I don't know what happened to them. Uh, they, they probably suffered and starved to death, probably. So before we get more into your experiences, let's let's do it chronologically, um, if you don't mind. So after Australia, take us through how you guys get to New Britain. We left uh, left Brisbane. Uh, uh, I think there was probably 300 guys, and uh, there was three radio men went with them. It took us only a couple of days, and we went up into New Britain. But we were there two nights, and then we went on up into Rabul and uh, chased the Japanese out of, out of that territory. Looking at your notes, if, if you don't mind, could you tell us the story about the river? You guys had to cross a river? We come to a, it's more or less a, a creek, really, and uh, the tank went down in the mud and he couldn't get, uh, you know, momentum. So I had to call the uh, engineering and uh, battalion and they brought a, probably took 20, 30 minutes, and they brought a bulldozer and pushed him out, and then uh, went back and kind of built the road. A little bit farther up, we uh, we encountered a Japanese uh, cannon. I think it was a 70, 70 millimeter. It was pretty good size. And uh, he was sitting in front of the road. And our Sherman tank, he just went and they run over top of him. I mean, the, the cannon. He had gotten two or three shots into the tank, but their, uh, their shells just bounced off the Sherman. And uh, so I was in back of the, the tank. And I looked around, and here two Japanese soldiers were standing on the long side of the road, just petrified. They was amazed that that Sherman would take out their cannon, you know. And that was kind of a funny, but 
uh, we, we, we went ahead and captured, rather than shoot them, we uh, captured it then, and, and one of the uh, one of the veterans uh, took him back to camp, both of them. Another little story, there was, when we, it happened to be Sunday morning, and all of us, about, about 30 of us, gathered in the chapel to give us a little 15 minute sermon. We started singing, and all of a sudden, all these people started coming out of the trees and thing. They wondered what that noise was. And they come out and listen to us in our, in our uh, sermon service. <laughs> These were natives? Yeah. Some of the ladies had babies and, and the guys. And there was probably, oh, about a 50 foot across. Uh, you can imagine how many just close together they would they would be to to you know to, to, to count them yeah they come out and kind of made a half circle they didn't come into camp they just come out of the out of the trees in the brush and uh, where they visualize and uh, stood there and listened to our <laughs> program I thought that was pretty cute during the invasion of Peladu, we uh, left our LST ships and uh, went aboard these little LCMs. And uh, they, they handled oh, probably about 20 men. And it, they were oh, submerged about half, half into the water. So as we approached the, the beach, we had to go over coral. The tracks got caught in some of the coral, so they were only able to fire from where they were until they, uh, the engineers got them out of there. But we, uh, we went ahead. When we got off the uh, LCMs, we, being we couldn't go clear to the beach, we, uh, we had to wait about halfway but waist deep in water until we got to the beach. And surprisingly, we didn't get that much firepower until we just about reached the beach. And that's when we had a lot of uh, firepower. And uh, many of the guys uh, in the tanks uh, were killed because they, you know, the, the they couldn't get out of the couldn't get out of the tanks. But once we got aboard beach, why? Well, then we we kind of gathered in a unit. I always remember my lieutenant told me, he said, "You're you're just like my shadow." He says, "When I turn to look, I want to see you there, because you're the only communications we have with with the company." So uh, he said, just kind of walk and zigzag and, and keep up with me. We were about 20, 20 foot, I think, from the airport. And my lieutenant and I uh, got in one of those craters and uh, we were waiting for more orders. And uh, somebody yelled, tanks. And my lieutenant stood up and he could see tanks coming across the airport. So he says, call the tank battalion. So I called and uh, we had three tanks, you know, three Shermans. I called, as, he said, I'll be there in about three minutes. And uh, so sure enough, he, he finally arrived. But by the time he arrived, the Japanese tanks, they're real small. Uh, they, they approached the edge of the airport, airport and 
we, we just stayed down in our foxhole, and uh, some of my guys with flamethrowers uh, took out the tanks, and uh, the Japanese soldiers would start out out the top, you know, open the top, and, and of course they would be killed on their way out. So, but uh, there was four tanks when the our tanks stopped them, they were within 20 feet of my lieutenant and myself. And this one fellow that I talked to, a uh, tank commander, he, man, he took out two of them with his, you know, cannon. And, uh, but there is a story to go with that. Years later, when I was volunteering, with the Veterans Association here in Roseburg. A fellow come in and asked for, he said, do you have a Nelson here? And uh, the clerk or nurse said, yes. And so I went out in the lobby and talked to him. He said, well, you don't know me, but he says, I got your name. And whenever I visit a VA, I always ask for you. But he was a tank commander the one that I had called, and here, seventy years later, he, we met again. Quite a coincidence. And so, what did it look like? You know, you mentioned that flamethrowers took out some of the tanks, and then another American tank took out the Jap, some of the Japanese tanks. I mean, can you describe what did that look like from your perspective? We had one fella that run up alongside the tank. And he was still moving. I seen that. And he was still moving. And he tossed grenades in the in the opening. <laughs> up, 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 and of course, it k killed those in the tank. But uh, was yeah. that was that at the airport at the same time? Yes, at the airport. Yeah. So this is so yeah. So there were flamethrowers that knocked out the Japanese tanks. There was the American tank. And then there was also this one Marine who threw grenades. Right. That's pretty brave. Yeah. Yeah, we uh, we got to talk to him later in the day, and, and he said, well, pretty gung-ho there, aren't you? He said, well, he said, we had to stop it. And I said, well, the lieutenant and I appreciate that. I said, that tank stopped within 20 feet from us. Can you tell us, uh, you know, you got on the beach, you, you told us about the airport. After the airport, tell us about some of the fighting that sticks out about Peleliu. They had, uh, Japanese had made caves in what we call the north end of the island. I was with my buddy. He was a radio man. And we were held up waiting for the troops to uh, go up into the caves. And the mortars had landed. They were uh, shelling us. And this mortar landed and hit my buddy and just tore his tummy apart. And he he says, you know, Russ, he says, you think I'm going to make it? And I said, well, we'll have the medics come and, come and see you. But as I says, you you stay put and no. I says, I'll stay with you. He says, Would you call my mother? And I said, I sure would. So he was able to write his address and uh and he was his mother's back in uh Wisconsin. So when I come home I wrote her and told her that I was with Jimmy at the time he was killed. Tell us about Jimmy. What kind of person was he? Oh, he was a, a pretty stocky young man. Uh, he was a couple of years older than I was. Uh, probably, he was probably 21, 22 perhaps. And uh, of course, a dandy, dandy young man. <laughs> and did you attempt any first aid? No, there was. No reason to. I mean, he died within 15 minutes. You know, 
So what what could I do? I just, I, you have to tell him something. So I told him the medics will be here just in a few minutes. But, uh, you know, with a wound like that, you, the men don't live very long. How did that affect you at the time, Mr. Nelson? I was much careful, much more careful, you know, realizing how quick uh, it could happen. And I had been fortunate so far, so far in the next, you know, for a few weeks and made you realize that uh, boy, life can be taken away in three seconds. Could you please tell us on Peleliu, some of the veterans who I've interviewed mentioned how hot it was and how you guys didn't get water for the first few days. Do you remember anything about that? I remember being told in our in our uh, interviews and uh, discussions before we ever landed that when you drink water, just take a sip of water because that has that canteen probably only held a quart and it had to last you all day. And what had happened, probably some of the soldiers, they, they drank it like a beer, you know. <laughs> okay, it's souvenir time. This is Japanese, what they call a Japanese sniper rifle. And uh, I found it in one of their camps. So I went ahead and put it in my sea bag and brought it home. It's a uh, it's bold action. And this is the bayonet that attaches here on the rifle. And can you show us where it goes, please? It, and it, it goes right in here. Like that. Where do you actually get this? What's the story? When we uh, went to this into this camp where the Japanese soldiers were, they had been there probably several days, and they when they vacated, they left a lot of uh, material, and this rifle was I found this rifle in, in amongst. Uh, some of their utensils. So I just went ahead and carried it back to camp and uh, put it in a sea bag and sent it home. On the next island uh, of Okinawa, uh, we were walking along and we got a lot of fire, uh, sniper fire. And I looked up and there a Japanese soldier had a, a little uh, platform and he was firing down in the troops and the lieutenant asked me if I could see him and I told him yes so I did shoot him and uh, of course he uh, lost his balance and came out of the tree coconut tree but uh, I it, it kind of bothered me later on I'd think about man you know, they just open fires. What a target price that he gave me. But as they say, kill or kill, be killed. That was some of our model. He had just killed one of our soldiers, and the lieutenant looked up and he says, "That that fire is coming from that tree." So I, he didn't have a rifle, so I used my little carbine. I shot quick and, and accurate. Oh, a sharp shooter. <laughs> Were there other times that you had the opportunity to fire at the enemy? See, the Japanese used to line up in a line and all charge forward. And they were pretty close apart. Probably, oh, I'd say 10 or 12 feet. And, uh, and that's, that's when I would be, I would use my rifle. During a bonsai charge. Right, yeah. 
And how far would you guys be when they would be charging like that? Oh, a couple hundred, probably a couple hundred yards. 300 feet, you know. And how many Japanese would be in that group, would you say? Probably 20. Would any of them even get close to you guys before getting mowed down? Not really, no. Most of the hand-to-hand -hand would be in the evening because uh, the soldiers would infiltrate in our lines. And uh, one of the guards that was supposed to be awake, perhaps, uh, missed one of the soldiers coming by him. One time, uh, when we were in a foxhole with my lieutenant, a Japanese soldier infiltrated uh, our, our camp, so to speak. This was a little bit darker at night. And he approached uh, our foxhole, and he had his rifle and bayonet, and he charged uh, the two of us. And I turned my back, and his saber hit my steel-jacketed radio, and it bounced off and went into the sand. So I was real fortunate. And it, it just made a little mark on my my radio. And, of course, Lieutenant killed him uh, when he fell. How did the Lieutenant kill him? <laughs> uh, what happened? He used his knife and killed a Japanese soldier. I I think that's all I want to say. But uh, we we picked him up and tossed him out of the. And he said, "Well, he said, why don't you go back to sleep?" And he says, "I'll." I'll stand guard to the lieutenant to, told me to rest and for a while. He says, I'll wake you up in two or three hours. And I said, okay. But, uh, Do you remember what island that was on? That, that was on Palo Alto. And so... Before the Japanese soldier came up right to your foxhole, did you guys have any idea? I mean, was it a total surprise when this oh, enemy? Oh, yeah. Yeah, because it was dark, you know. Uh, of course, actually, your eye, in the darkness, your eyes get, get accustomed to the darkness. So you can see a little bit. I mean, we was able to see. It didn't. It didn't seem like it was black, black, you know. It just. It just seemed like. Well, perhaps it wasn't that. Uh, that late in the night. Eight or nine o'clock, but it was dark anyway. But uh, no, we had no idea of, until we looked up and there he was. That must have been. You know, you would have been twenty years old, right? Twenty-one. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking about it. What was that like for you? I mean, that must have been such a traumatic experience. That, <laughs> right. That close to you. That's right. Well, here again is in my second close engagement, uh, you know, of death, so to speak. Uh, I don't know. I. I I just, it's part of war. Uh, it, it didn't affect me like it, it did some of these young men coming home now. I don't know. I, I think they have a different mindset than us guys did in the First World War. Not to put, put them down, you know. After the... Uh, Peleliu invasion, after we secured the island, we, uh, our next in, 
invasion was Okinawa. And, uh, of course, we didn't know what island it was we were going to until about halfway there. But we sailed for several days, and when we uh, reached the island, the Navy was, was bombarding the island. And uh, so they stopped when we started uh, getting aboard our LCMs. But, but we, uh, we went aboard, uh, yeah, the, the, the watercraft, and we, we had no resistance, uh, no, no rifle fire, no mortars, or nothing going into the island and uh, on the beach. So we, uh, we, we, uh, we landed and uh, right away uh, the ship started sending out our supplies and our tanks. Uh, they, they arrived uh, that morning and the after afternoon, and uh, so we, I don't remember when we, we first encountered the Japanese, but we had went, uh, went into the island quite a, while, quite a ways, uh, and here again there was a, airport and the troops had already they went across the airport and uh, the Americans was, uh, the Americans already yes uh, our troops and uh, but there were no sniper fire or nothing the majority of the fighting on Okinawa ended up in the south south end uh, well from the center on south because down south is where the, the Chino, what do they call it, Chino? The Shuri Line? Yes, the Japanese headquarters. This place was, uh, we surrounded, and it was Shuri Castle. And that's where the uh, Japanese uh, units were. And there was quite a bit of fighting there. When they went into the castle, when they took started in the building, they had realized that their commander had killed himself. Here's another souvenir. It's a hairy carry knife, and it's used for suicidal uh, soldier. Usually, the officers use this when they lost a particular battle. And I got this from out of Okinawa when we went to the Shuri Castle on, uh, on our invasion. This was taken from their, uh, the guys that went to Shuri Castle, we had a chance to pick out any particular uh, weapons, and I, and I picked this one out. I think we were 52 days on the front lines, if I remember. Um, and that, that was without relief or anything. That was day by day fighting and, you know, in, encountering the Japanese soldiers. So that was a long time. So Tell us about the civilians on Okinawa, please. What do you remember about them? We were on the, on the north, north, north side, and my buddy and I, he was from Texas. Uh, we went into one of the houses, you know, to make sure the civilians were captured, 
is where we, we ran into this room and the rug moved. So we took our rifle butts and punched it through the carpet. And then a little old man, he, he raised up and held up his hands. So we gave him an apple and a candy bar and told him it was okay. And we didn't hurt him. So, but we encouraged him to come out with us so that the, uh, our units could take him back, you know, where the, uh, the occupation forces were, where the civilians were being held. But he was, he was real happy to get, <laughs> to get that candy bar and apple. You know, he probably hadn't uh, eaten for several days, I'm sure. But he was well in his 60s, I would say. But that's the only one that I had really encountered. Some of the veterans who I've interviewed, they mentioned at nighttime, a lot of the civilians would try to move. And sometimes you guys, or some of the American outfits, thought it was Japanese soldiers and it would open up. Well, we knew about it, but I mean, we, we wasn't engaged uh, with that group. Yeah, at nighttime, you never know who's walking through the area, you know. We had passwords, and uh, like apple tree or, or butterfly, you know, something just strange. And uh, but each day we'd get a we we get a code to, to go by to 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 be with. So. So you better, you're going to go out at night, remove any of uh, <laughs> go out and get, fill your canteen, you better remember your password. But, and that was given to you the first thing in the morning before our troops moved out. And, and can you tell me, on, on Okinawa, the Japanese had tombs. What do you remember about those tombs? Well, they, they had, uh, they were, had con concrete structures, and a lot of them were, were their burial places, or they built them for them, but they had a little, oh, probably a four by ten inch crack. And that's quite a story about, I, got, I can tell you about that. But they had the machine gun stuck out of that. We had a baseball player, a pitcher, and he threw a hand grenade from about 50 or 60 feet through that tiny <laughs> crack. He very accurate. And but uh, it, it was, of course, it went in, it went in and, and exploded, you know, and uh, shut down the machine gun. But we always kidded him. We'd always tell him, "Well, you ready, for, <laughs> ready, ready for a ball game?" <laughs> and uh, but he'd laugh. But he was sure accurate. Don't seem possible he could do that. Even thinking now, how did he throw that grenade in a four inch, maybe a six inch space, you know? We would encounter a piece of sod, and before we approached it, we had heard they dug in, they, they dug in a, like a well and put uh, boards and can, uh, grass and everything where they could raise up. And they'd raise it up about six inches and fire from there. And a lot of troops, uh, a lot of submarines were killed that way. 
So you really had to watch ahead. And that's re that's one time I, I used my rifle. I forgot about that. And I fired into the, where he, we had his, I seen a, I seen the dirt raise up about a three foot square. And I see the rifle come out and I fired into the, into there. So. What happened? And the top came down. So the lieutenant and I, he, he told me just come on. He says, our troops will take care of that. So. I don't know whether he was killed or somebody else killed him, you know. But uh, I forgot about that. <laughs> and do you remember where that was? I, th I think that was on Okinawa. And so they would have these little hiding holes. Right, yeah. And you couldn't tell until they lifted up? Right. And I mean, it blended right in with the grass and the sod and it's pretty scary. Very. Yeah. And they would be about, oh, maybe 50, 60 foot apart. And they kind of knew where the troops would be coming, you know, because of the landing uh, places. They knew the hazardous, you know, so they knew that the troops would be coming up within that 100-foot space or something, and uh, that's where they built their, uh, of course, uh, they had built them long before we invaded the island. Did you have any experiences with the Japanese planes, were you on any of the islands? Were you strafed or oh, bombed? Yes, on Okinawa, Okinawa Island, we had. Uh, I was with a, a company, and we we went up into one of the barracks, and we was going to set up there and stay overnight. A, a small plane, uh, like the size of a Piper Club plane. Uh, came over our area, and we thought they was going to, you know, strife us. But he, evidently, he had no rifles. And he came, and I looked up, and he was within 50 foot of me. He was real low. And I could just about see his, I could see his helmet and his face, and he looked at us. So just as he started to leave us, we started firing on him, and we have we heard later on that he had crashed about a mile out of out of our area. So evidently, some of the big rifles must have uh, got into his gas tank or something. I suppose wow. that was pretty scary. Yeah. So, are there any other close encounters that you could mention? Things that stick out. During your whole time overseas, New Britain, Peleliu, Okinawa, are there any other close calls? During the last three weeks of Okinawa, I was assigned to the radio jeep, and I had parked right in the back of a real cliff. It was about 50 foot high. Oh, no, about 30 foot high. And my, I, I parked the jeep, and I, and I dug a foxhole right beneath the the uh, the dirt, you know, the the well, the ridge, and I dug a foxhole there, and of course I was all alone, and, and the other guys were all around underneath the caves and the various places, you know, all within maybe a hundred square foot, but I was laying there and. I could hear people talk. I could hear noises. So I stood up and I was going to call to the guys to be quiet, you know, to give away our thing. And and the, the closer I listened, it was a Japanese calling or talking. And they had undermined that whole ridge and you could hear 
being as I was that close and that deep in the ground, there was no interaction of noise around me, so I could hear through through the dirt, you know. And probably it was probably about four or five foot deep, I'm sure. They wouldn't they wouldn't have dug too far out, you know, to open. But the 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 they started dropping mortars in there and the mortar landed on our unit and the shrapnel come come over and took out my generator underneath my Jeep. And of course it went on through through the Jeep, took out the my my generator and hit the bank above me. So it kind of scared me. So I, so I got up, uh, and went over with the other guys because it, it had started raining, and I, you know, I couldn't. There was no other than my my poncho, and that didn't do him much good because we had I punched holes in the dirt, then hung a poncho. I kind of have a on an angle for a, you know, to to deter the rain, but it didn't really rain that hard. But I got up, left my radio, because I couldn't call nobody, and I went back over underneath the, the caves and told the guys that had the portable to call that, that the, the jeep, the command uh, was out of out of business, and uh, but they, surprisingly, they they brought me that uh, another jeep the next day, another radio jeep, and they took mine away. And of course, I had no personal in, you know, no personal items in the jeep. Uh, that I needed to take out. So they brought me a new radio, a new Jeep. Uh, the thing is, they parked it in the same place. And I and I joked with the driver. I told him, I said, hey, I said, they're going to gonna, they're gonna get me tonight. He said, well, he said, you can move it where you want to. So then I checked back on in the unit and I told him that the Command radio was back in business. So. so tell me about your living conditions on the front lines. When you were on these islands, can you tell us about where you would sleep at night, what you would eat, how you would clean yourself, that kind of stuff? Usually when we went into to an area where, where it would be so-called permanent unit, we... Uh, and we would work from there, you know. It might be across the island, it might be the other end of the island, or wherever. Uh, we we uh, dug a foxhole, a couple of, couple of foot deep, and we we carried a little spade that folded up in the handle, <laughs> and uh, you unfolded it, you start digging. And uh, you were laying there. You would you use your poncho, and oh, it was always warm. And if it rained, you'd put your put your uh, put your covering over your foxhole. And usually, uh, usually there would be three or four guys that would be close to one another. Now the Virginia go out in the open and, you know, pitch your tent. But uh, but most, we didn't have cots or nothing, and we uh, just lay on the ground, smoothed the, smoothed the rocks and pebbles away, <laughs> and uh, slept on the ground. And, uh, of course, we'd be awakened uh, in the morning. You. 
So, thank you for sharing that with us. Do you remember how you guys got food on the front lines? What you would eat? Was it just rations or? Mostly rations. And what would come in a ration? Little chicken. Oh, little chicken. Uh, uh, salmon. Once in a while we'd get uh, little biscuits. Uh, if we'd happen to have a delivery that day. And uh, they would, uh, you know, I don't remember how they were delivered <laughs> to our unit, but uh, they would bring in so-called truck and, uh, and, and then the, someone from a, or a company would come and pick up that unit or the, the food for that unit. In other words, if he had 30 people, I, you know, he'd pick up uh, 30 or 40 dinners. But, uh, but our breakfast was, was uh, we had, they had little, they had canned milk. And you could actually uh, have, you know, have hot cereal. I know, not hot cereal, but you'd have cool cereal. Maybe, maybe, uh, oh, cornflakes or Rice Krispies or something like that. And you'd have enough uh, milk and it'd probably, it'd probably feel, probably be a, a, a cup full of milk. And it uh, wasn't like the good old fashioned Nebraska cream <laughs> that we used to have. But uh, it would be, it would be eatable, and, and uh, it it fill our need. So after Okinawa, sir, what happens to you? Oh, after we secured the island of Okinawa, the uh, they had dropped the bomb on Japan, but we were still fighting for about two weeks afterwards. There were Japanese soldiers coming out of the caves and uh, somehow they got word that the war was over. And uh, except one unit, one unit was, oh, several weeks, a, a whole company and a lieutenant finally come marching out of the caves down the valley and turned himself into a Navy commander on the south end of the island. And uh, so anyway, after we was secured a few units like that, then we went aboard ship and went to Chinese, China. And we went into, into Tinsen, China. That was a uh, that was a port, a navy port. And and from there we went to uh, Beijing. We uh, I, I I keep saying we. I I'm talking about the radio group, you know. Yeah. And there was four of us, and we, uh, well, we, I don't think we paid rent, but we, uh, we moved into this, this little actual house, and uh, we set up our radio, and being as I was command, I set up the, the main main radio, and our troops, the Marines. They m marched up and down along the fence, 
because the Japanese soldiers were on the other side of the fence. It was about eight or nine feet, not nine foot metal fence. And they got along together. I mean, they was marching back and forth, you know. And uh, we had been invited, our officers were invited to a dinner with the Japanese officers. So my my buddy Marine from Wisconsin, Kino, him and I went with us, and went with them, with I uh, with four of our officers, and we sat around this big pot, so to speak, and they cooked the meal right there. That was quite an experience. They had uh, the little ladies, uh, they would bring in old fish and, and their vegetables and stuff and put in the pot. But it was very tasty, very good. But after dinner, one of the officers came to Keno and I and asked if we had ridden horses. We, and we told him we were both from the farm. And he said, well, how would you like to take a ride with our Japanese soldiers? We told him, sure, we'd be glad to do that. So we did. We, so two of us and the two soldiers, we rode the horses, core horses, and we followed what so-called cavalry, you know, up and down hills. And we went about a mile. Then we came back, and, and uh, they took care of our horses, and we went up the camp. And one of the soldiers took off his shoes and wanted me to have his riding boot. So I took off my Marine dress shoes, and he says, "No, no," he says, "I, this is a gift to you. I, I don't." I don't need nothing to return. He spoke English. So I, I told him, thank you. So, man, I, I wore them boots about three years on my dad's <laughs> lumber mill down there. Good riding boots. This is another souvenir that was given to a couple of us. This is a, a Japanese officer's saber. And of course, they carried it on their, on their uh, waist, waistband. I received this. We went right in with a couple of Japanese soldiers. And when we came back, my buddy and I from Wisconsin, when we came back, the officer said that you men treated my men very nice, and he says, I'd like to present to you a gift. So he handed me the gift, and it was a saber. You know, you're meeting face to face with the people who you were trying to kill just a few months before. That's right. Talk to me about your feelings towards the Japanese during the war. There was no friendship, of course, and, and there was no hard feelings either. I mean, I, I can't remember. There was no feelings. I mean, you, you, if you see a soldier, you, you just shot him. I mean, that's terrible to say now. But uh, there was really no feelings. These two soldiers that we that uh, we rode with, one spoke just a little bit of English, and uh, we got on fine. And we didn't mention the war or nothing. You know, where 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 we had been, uh, or nothing like that. So after occupation duty, Mr. Nelson, what happens? Oh, 
We, uh, I had a date <laughs> while in China. And the little lady, she was, she was a teacher at the university. So I was fortunate to uh, ask for ask her out, and we we went up. She took me up uh, on the China Wall. That was really an experience. We were spent the whole afternoon up there. And was she Chinese or an American? Ch Chinese. And uh, so when we came back, uh, I, I, I took her to dinner. There's a river that goes through the city. And we took a ride on the riverboat. So she thought that was pretty nice. So, and we got, come off the ship and her boat and uh, we got in our little taxi and uh, They, they took, took her back to her apartment, and she wouldn't let me know where she lived. Of course, that was, that was their, uh, what, rules or whatever. Their so, custom. Yeah. So they, uh, there was a custom that they would stay about a block away. Then as soon as she got out of the little jitney, why... The uh, the little guy would turn and take me back, and uh, she would walk and to her apartment. After China, take us through how you get home and your first reunion with your family. Okay, please. When we were ready to uh, leave China, uh, we we went aboard ship, and it was. Uh, during the last part of December, and we had Christmas dinner aboard ship on the way home. So we uh, we went into San Diego, and from there we went to well they had a kind of a marine headquarters there, where you didn't go back to the San Diego you know, the base, they had they had the units right where you check out and you would go right home from there. With the four of us, uh, for the Marines, when we got discharged, we, we went to Chico, Chico, California, where the university was. And uh, then the, the fellow took the took the car back to the rental unit there in Chico. And of course we paid for the you know the rental. But I, we stayed overnight a couple a couple of nights and we had a couple of dates <laughs> uh, there in Chico. And then my two friends said, Well, how are you going home? And I said, I don't know, we'll grab the bus. Oh, I says, let's take us. We'll take you home. He says We've never been to Oregon. We've been lived in. They lived in. They lived in Chico, and his father was a dairyman. They had the, He had the dairy for, for for the Chico city, and uh, so we got in this little VW, and he <laughs> he 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 brought me clear to Oregon, clear to Grants Pass. And uh, my folks had bought 500 acres of timber from Sacramento. They moved up here. And so the road was about a mile back up into the timber. So we got about halfway in our little, our little uh, VW got stuck. <laughs> he he kind of run off the road because it was a dirt road. Dad built it. And uh, so we we got out and lifted it up, and set it over out of the wheel, fuel tracks, and we went on to to the folks. So I told him I said, "Why don't you guys stay over?" He said, "No, we better go back." It was 
Oh, probably 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. He said, no, we'll go back and have something in Grant's Pass for lunch. And so we greeted each other, thanked each other, got each other's address. And uh, my, my folks uh, came out to, you know, and they, uh, Dad met the boys and told them thanks a lot. And, I wondered if he could pay, pay the gas, and they said no. And uh, they said, no, our dad already took care of this because they knew it was, it was bringing a veteran home. So, I don't know, we, uh, we just got together. Mom cried. <laughs> I'd been gone for three years, you know, and uh, surprisingly, uh, Dad said, well, you know, first chance I have, he says, you can go in and buy your new car. And I said, well, I don't know if, I says, I sent Mom uh, money home, and she had saved every dollar that I sent home. You know, I only got $54 a month, and she sent every dollar and Dad put enough with it to, I went down to Sacramento and bought me a 41 Chevy, brand new. And uh, that was pretty nice of her, you know. You sent the money home for them? Yeah. Not expecting them to save it? No, no, I, no. Well, I figured Dad would, you know, put some in the bank or, man, they didn't need any money. They was doing fine, you know in his mill. In fact, he hired a couple people. My two brothers worked with him, and uh, he was doing fine. Can you tell me more about your emotions when you got out of that car and you saw your folks? Oh. After everything you had gone through? No, I just, I just run and hug mom, you know. And, of course, dad was right there, too. So... But and your brother? Good to be home. Your brothers who were in the service, what happened? How did they get home? Were they already home? Yes. Uh, yeah, my brother Jack, uh, he was in that weapons platoon. Uh, platoon. And uh, yeah, he'd, he'd come home. He beat me home. Uh, they left about the 1st of December. And. Uh, I have a picture of my unit standing waiting to go board ship. Did you have difficulties readjusting to civilian life? Not really. Not like the other guys did. No. Did you have nightmares? Once in a while I had I had dreams of my buddy and also the uh of the bayonet, you know. Uh into my Radio, you know, radio unit. But I'd wake up and then, and wherever I was, I'd get up and walk around out in the kitchen and come back. But I was only uh, single for a year. Got home in March and we got married in November. How did you meet your wife? With a cafe and. Grants Pass. She was waiting on tables, and I asked her for a date. I think we dated about three times. So then I, my folks had not been back to Nebraska, so I told Dad I would break in our new car and take him back to Nebraska. And he said, okay, I'll pay for the gas. <laughs> so I, I, I done that. So he drove part of the way, and we was back there a couple of weeks. And then when we came back, I had brothers and sisters in Iowa. There was eight of us in the family, four sisters and eight brothers. And uh, most all of them were alive. So I had uh, Iowa and Nebraska uh, to meet everybody, you know. But you and Jack were the only ones in the service. Right. 
Well, my brother was, he had, uh, uh, he was about, oh, four years ahead of us. And he had volunteered there in Michigan when we were there. And, but he had cancer uh, uh, in his legs. And so that they wouldn't take him, you know. He had signed up and, and, and then his legs started to worry, worry him. And he told him, the medics, and they, they made x-rays. He says, uh, you have bone cancer. But he lived for another 30 years. Tell me a little bit about your volunteering history. After I had been married for several years, uh, we moved to Roseburg, and I needed some medical care, so I went over to the Veterans Association, the health center, and uh, they uh, jokingly said, oh, you come to volunteer? I said, you need volunteers? He says, you bet. So I signed up, and I stayed with them for 23 years. And uh, I only worked one day a week. And uh, I helped the nurses make copies of, uh, of our medical units or medical reports. And I'd make copies and take it back to the nurse or the, or the doctor. And uh, then I put away put away material. Uh, I used a computer once in a while, only on a limited uh, time. And then I volunteered usually in one what they call clinic. And they had blue, uh, blue, red, and green Clinics, and there was usually about three dollars in three <laughs> three doctors in each clinic, and I'd go to a different clinic, maybe that afternoon, and do what they need to have done, you know, copies or whatever, or the doctors had some orders to deliver someplace to another place, so would hand deliver them up to a up to the uh, psych unit or, or uh, over to the x-ray wherever they some other some other place where they couldn't mail you know I volunteered and stayed with the VA for 6900 hours can you tell us what advice do you want to give to future oh. generations what do you want them to know well I believe that would be to their advantage when they got out of high school. If they want to go to college, that's great. But they should go to college. And I, I only had two years of college, junior college. But if they don't go to university, why, I think they should take the, R, take the ROC uh, the ROTC training and to see how they like, you know, the strict uh, marching and uh, the rules and regulations, what they're told. And I says, if you can go through that, I said, it's not hard. And then go ahead and, and join uh, the Air Force, the Army, anywhere. I said, the Army's got a good program for young men. And I says, a couple of years in the service. I says, you won't necessarily be fighting. I says, you could be going to go some base and be a bookkeeper or something. And I says, the only thing you would be paid for by the government 
And I says, you'd have uh, two years, you know, at least two years. And I said, that's what I would suggest for the young men or the young ladies. What would you like to see future generations do that would make you feel like the sacrifices you and the other World War II veterans made was worth it? I would like to see some change in their mind and attitude. I mean, the young men, you know, to take it serious on their bookkeeping and... Uh, an algebra, if they have to take algebra. Take one unit of Spanish, uh, so that they, if they go, to, if they go to Spain or wherever Mexico, they'd be able to communicate. And if a if a young fellow, I, I'm talking about the young men now. If they would really get serious, and you don't have to toss away your your keyboard, your smartphone, but I say to use it for importance, not not to text one an hour and another and have fun with it, because it is a computer. And I, it, 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 it will hold all the information you, you talk about. And I said, sometimes that information is going to get out if it's not properly handled. So that's what I would say. So many, just in the paper, every, every week you, you find in the paper of uh, th thefts, Stealing cars, drugs is real bad. Uh, I was real fortunate. I wasn't. Well, I wasn't on Vietnam, so a lot of the young fellas got hooked on, you know, marijuana and stuff. Were you religious during the war or now? I mean, uh, no. Uh, coming right out of high school, you know. Uh, I was a so-called teenager, you know, went to soccer meets, went roller skating, and uh, I that wasn't real, real concerned about church, you know. I mean, I mean, I didn't, I didn't know the Lord, and although I went to uh, Sunday school with with my mother in Sacramento, you know, while I went to high school, so, but anyway, I. I didn't. Uh, I I didn't uh, know the Lord until after we got married and we settled down and decided we we better get with with God and let us let Him take us through life, you know. And my wife was all for it, and so we joined the old church. And over the years, the while we was in L.A. What kind of man do you want people to always think of you as? Kind, passionate, gentle, uh, forgiving, be happy, and treat your friends like you would like to be treated. Yeah. What would you want to say to the men who were killed in the war? What would you want them to know? That they give they, they give the lives for the for the United States, you know, for America. And probably that we don't know whether God called them when they were killed. Or where, where they went, but they would. They actually they made quite a sacrifice, just like my friend, you know. 
and uh, I'm I'm one of the thousand lucky lucky ones, I guess. <laughs>